Welcome to Chapter 13, uh, Bank Risk Management and Performance. Credit risk in general. So when a bank lends, uh, then it has to look at who it's lending to and try and evaluate the risk that it's taking on. That is called credit risk. And he calls it the five C's of credit risk. This is what they teach you if you become a banker, by the way. The first of all is, uh, the first thing is character. That is, you know, what kind of person is this person? Are they someone who looks after their finances or are they someone who's really hasn't got a clue about their finances most of the time? Um, you can usually get a feel for that when you meet with them. And you find out why they're borrowing the money, what the money is for, and uh, whether they have a, a grasp of the um, figures that they're dealing with for whatever they're borrowing the money for. If is it a house purchase, is it a car purchase, what is it? A business loan, you would want them to explain their business plan, etc. Capacity. Um, you know, what's the capacity to pay this back? Could they pay it back immediately? Or is it something that uh, they would not be able to pay back immediately? And it would be something that would only be paid, but pay, it could be paid back over time. By the way, that's why a lot of people will not lend to people who are currently unemployed, um, simply because their capacity to, to uh, pay it back, um, even though they have a high need for... Um, money many of the unemployed but their capacity to pay it back is not very high so there are better bets as far as the banks are concerned in terms of who they lend to capital uh, that is you know what do they have in terms of uh, assets do they have a house do they have cars uh, what kind of assets do they have collateral um, is there something that they could uh, put up for the loan, so to guarantee the loan. So if it's a car loan, it will be the actual car. If it's a mortgage, it will be the actual house. Um, so that's collateral. That's in addition to, to the capital that they might have, of course. And then the conditions um, on that credit risk as well. You know, what are the conditions of the loan? Um, is there... Uh, is there any chance of the loan being called in? Um, you know, is this a variable interest loan? Is this a fixed interest loan? Obviously, it's a variable interest loan. Then it fluctuates with how market interest rates fluctuate. So if those rise, then the payments on the loan rises as well. By the way, in some countries, this is how mortgages are. Mortgages are mostly variable rate mortgages. Um, so I remember when I lived in the UK, um, the standard mortgage that you could get was a variable rate mortgage. But that meant if that you were really tied to what the monetary policy was uh, in that country, because if the interest rates went up, that meant, that meant your payments went up. If mortgage payments, if interest rates went down, that meant that your payments went down. So um, that means that, you know, other source, other spending also varies as interest rate varies. In other words, if interest rates go up, of course, you have to spend more on your mortgage and therefore you've got less money to spend on other things. If interest rates go down, then you've got um, lower mortgage payments and therefore your, your uh, uh, spending on other things could increase. They always said in the UK, by the way, that when mortgage, you know, when, when interest rates went down, it was like getting a tax cut. Interest rates went up, it was like getting a tax increase. Okay, so how do we evaluate credit risk with consumers? Well, there are three major credit bureaus in the US, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. And uh, those three bureaus keep records on all people who borrow money in any form whether it's credit cards loans or whatever so um, 
if you've taken a loan of any type, then you will have a record with the credit bureaus. In fact, there was a big uh, hoo-ha recently, a big problem, because Equifax um, had a data breach and um, hackers managed to get the records of millions of people. So um, there was a class action lawsuit against Equifax. And um, I'm sure that all these credit bureaus now have a lot more uh, internet cyber security uh, uh, in place. Well, I hope they do anyway. So the credit report is basically your credit history. And you're given the credit score. It's a measurement of how, as an individual, you've used credit in the past. It takes into account all sorts of things, um, as things such as, you know, do you make your payments on time? Do you have made payments? Do you have no payments? How many credit cards do you have? You know, how responsible have you been looking after your credit cards in, in the past? And it goes back five years. So it's a considerable um, length of time that they look at. Um, these FICO scores, um, these are uh, ratings. It first came from, it was called FICO. It comes, comes from Fair Isaacs and Company, which was the entity that first created those scores. And the range for these FICO scores is from 300 to 800. So the higher the FICO score, the lower the borrower's credit risk. So the better the person is um, to, in terms of making that loan uh, too. So, you know, if lenders are trying to minimize the credit risk that they're taking on, typically banks, then they use the following techniques. First of all, specialized lending. If you can specialize in a certain type of borrower, then usually you'll have a lot more knowledge about that type of borrower. I noticed, for instance, that uh, American Bank, uh, which is uh, headquartered in Corpus Christi, have uh, decided that they want to specialize in small businesses. So obviously they have some expertise in small businesses. And if you're a larger business in the Coastal Bend, you're probably not going to go to American Bank. Um, uh, it could be size of firm, as it is with American Bank. It could be type of firm as well, in a certain industry, for example. Um, etc. So uh, those types of lending are uh, the types of things that banks can do so that they have a better idea of the type of consumer or the type of business that they're lending to. Understanding the cash flows. Um, you know, if you're a farmer, for instance, your cash flows are very dependent on when your crops um, go to market at that point you're paid for all the work that you've done during the year so your cash flows are going to be very seasonal and banks you know can understand those things and will understand that they have to obviously have uh, lines of credit and loans available at certain times a year particularly when it's coming up towards when uh, when uh, the crops are going to be ready to take to market second resources of repayment so um, the banks also need to be, you know, have to be aware of the fact that the borrowers may default. So in other words, they want some collateral um, against their loan. Of course, they would get that if it was an auto loan, they'd automatically get the car. Hence, you get repos. Um, compensating balance. Now, this often is the, is the case if you want a credit card and you have extremely poor credit then the credit card company will give you a credit card, but you'll have to keep a balance on that credit card. So in other words, you'll have to tie up some of your own money in order to get a credit card. Personal guarantees, um, this often is the case with parents, but other individuals could also sign for a loan for someone. And uh, that means that the other person is on the hook to um, repay the loan if the uh, borrower uh, defaults. By the way, that's something I would avoid at all costs. Um, there are so many stories of people um, taking on loans uh, um, as personal guarantees, personal guarantors for someone else, uh, 
even in, even within family and having them default and then having the realization that they are the bank is going to come after them and they are responsible for repaying that balance close monitoring as well uh, so in other words uh, monitoring what's going on uh, so for example um, uh, with my mortgage uh, for example I have to prove to the bank that's giving me the mortgage that I have insurance on the property and I have to do that every year um, the bank wants to know that uh, because of course the uh, property is collateral so they want to make sure that if it burns down that the that there will still be money available to repay that loan so close monitoring of what's going on with the borrower in terms of you know if for instance I don't have any insurance one year on the property then that's going to be a red flag as far as the bank is going to concern is, is concerned and they're going to pursue me and ask me why I don't have uh, insurance and they will insist that I get insurance otherwise they will consider revoking that loan same thing goes with companies you know is there some kind of way that the bank can closely monitor that particular company maybe it can ask to see um, annual reports from that company or uh, annual accounts um, so that it can check how the business is doing and check that they will uh, there is unlikely to be a, a default on, on the loan that they're given to that particular business. So banks obviously want to manage the interest rate risk as well. And remember that, you know, as far as interest rates are concerned, they affect both sides of the bank's balance sheets. So interest rates don't mean, remain constant, they move around. And so the bank, if you remember, makes its money um, in terms of its balance sheet from the difference between the interest rate it charges on loans and the interest rate it has to pay on deposits. Now banks call that the interest rate spread. So you can see that in the equation there. So obviously um, if interest rates in the economy rise that that tends to increase the interest rate on loans more than it raises the interest rate on deposits. So banks tend to make a bigger profits as interest when interest rates are higher. At the moment, of course, interest rates on loans are also very low and interest rates on deposits are low. So the interest rate spread is very narrow right now. So bank profitability has been much affected. And that's why many banks now are charging fees just to have an account. So I bank with American Bank right now and they charge me a fee, uh, a monthly fee. And typically, small banks have to, have to do that. It's only larger banks that can probably get away with not charging uh, fees, account fees, maybe because they can they can get uh, income through off balance sheet activities instead. Plus, it is a good ploy to attract customers. And in fact, I'm probably going to change my bank in the next <laughs> couple of months for that very reason. So, when you look at the bank's balance sheet, um, often. Uh, analysts who evaluate the uh, the uh, the health of the bank will look at these two measures that we're going to talk about now, which is gap analysis and durational analysis. So let's do gap analysis first. So it's a way of measuring the interest rate exposure of the bank. You compare the amount of interest rate sensitive assets a bank has with the amount of interest rate sensitive liabilities. As you have to remember, some of the assets don't that the bank has don't charge an interest rate so for instance the physical assets it has uh, the buildings etc that the bank owns they don't pay an interest rate so they they wouldn't be included as an interest rate sensitive asset similarly of course cash is and the reserves generally are not interest rate sensitive either in other words when interest rates in the economy move does the interest rate change on these assets um, so if it's a fixed mortgage, by the way, it still wouldn't be an interest rate sensitive asset because if it's a fixed mortgage, then the interest rate's not going to change if the interest rates in the economy change. Similarly, interest rate sensitive loans or liabilities, I should say, uh, is, this, is the second term there on the right hand side. 
So the gap is measured just by the interest rate sensitive assets minus the interest rate sensitive liabilities. So when interest rates are going up, you want profitability to increase. So you want to have more interest rate sensitive assets than liabilities. And that means your gap will increase. Now, if interest rates are coming down in the economy, you want less interest rate sensitive uh, assets and you want more interest rate sensitive liabilities because what you're paying you know, is then going to come down faster than what you earn, which uh, gives you as well a bigger gap. So the trouble is you really have to know which way interest rates are moving in the economy. So. There's a lot of analysis that's done by banks to try and figure out uh, where we are in the business cycle because that tends to determine the direction of monetary policy. So the change in income, income from basically interest rates, is the gap times the change in that interest rate in, in the economy. So that gives them the change in uh, interest sensitive income. Of course, it's going to be the change in income anyway, because the other assets are not sensitive to the interest rate. So um, they wouldn't be affected if the, there is a change in the interest rate in any case. Another way, a much more complex way of looking at it, in my opinion, is duration analysis. This measures the time it takes for the bondholder or debt holder to recover the price paid for the bond or amount lent from all the discounted future cash flows from the bond or debt instrument. So it's a way of saying, OK, how long is this asset being held for? Is there a date here? And um, same thing with liabilities. So the discount rate for calculating the present value of the cash flow is the bond or debt instrument's yield. So if the bond price and yield changes, so does its duration. So in other words, the duration here, this W, is equal to the payment divided by 1 plus r to the t, divided by the bond price. Now, I'm not going to ask you to calculate those things, but maybe there's an exercise in, in the Aclia part of this chapter that does. But basically, it's it, what it's doing is looking at the duration of the assets and duration of the liabilities. Liabilities, of course, can have a duration if we're talking about um, CDs, for example. And uh, same thing, you know, we're talking about duration for assets like securities uh, and bonds. So it looks at, it basically weights the gap analysis by the duration of the assets. So the duration gap is the difference between the weighted by the assets duration of the bank's assets and the weighted by the liabilities duration of the liabilities adjusted for the bank's asset size. If a duration gap is zero, then interest rate changes affect the value of the bank's assets and liabilities equally, leaving the value of the bank unchanged. So in other words, if the duration on the asset side is roughly the same as the duration on the liability side, then it shouldn't affect the bank. However, if the duration is bigger on the asset side, than, than on the liability side, then for instance, if interest rates in the economy go up, that would tend to push yields up on bonds, that tends to push prices down on bonds. So that would tend to affect the assets uh, more than the liabilities, for instance. So that would be if uh, you had a positive duration gap. Obviously the opposite if you have a negative duration gap. So bank management has to make a decision about the size of the duration gap it wants. How much difference does it want in terms of the yield, the, the maturity on the asset side versus the maturity on the liability side? That's really what it's talking about. Okay, moving on. Um, this is called liquidity risk. So we've really done um, credit risk. Uh, we've done asset management risk, and this is now liquidity risk. So liquidity risk is one of the oldest risks in fractional, fractional, that should read fractional, not factional, reserve banking. Fractional reserve banking means that there's uh, 
a fraction of the deposits that has to be held in reserves or as reserves. And the sources of liquidity, the ultimate source, of course, is the reserves because that's cash available to meet an increased demand, for instance, from the general public to withdraw their deposits from the bank. So what are the sources of that liquidity that could meet that demand, say, to withdraw monies from the bank? Well, obviously the primary reserves, and those are the ones that we basically talked about in terms of the minimum reserve requirements. In fact, there are two levels of reserves. There's also what we call secondary reserves, and they tend to be T-bills. The reason why they're T-bills are that those are assets, in other words, short-term bonds, uh, where the market for those is very, very liquid. In other words, it's very easy to turn those bonds, uh, those treasury bills, uh, very short-term T-bills, into cash. So they are called often secondary reserves. And then, of course, there's bank loan securities. Um, So oftentimes those are kind of interbank loans. You can call them in back from another bank. Banks are very loath to call in loans because uh, they know that that really upsets customers and they're unlikely to see those customers back again if they do that. However, in a real emergency, they will call in loans if they need to. To lower liquidity risk, a bank has to accept lower returns. Uh, The reason why is it has to have that money available. Um, As I said, just in case there's a run on the bank or there's an extra demand, for people to liquidate their deposits and they because they need cash for whatever reason. Um, so those lower returns could hurt its profitability and thus its ability to continue in business. And that can be the case. Uh, you know, if, if uh, a bank has a really a very sudden, uh, was expecting a sudden withdrawal of deposits, then it may have a lot more liquidity um, available than usual. In that case, of course, it's earning less income because um, it ha- has less income earning assets. It has less out in loans. And that obviously affects the future um, existence of the bank as well. So, you know, the bank has to make money. So what are the solutions if you have a lack, lack of liquidity? Um, so first of all, probably the, the cheapest is to uh, borrow federal funds. So that is just going to the Fed funds market, borrow excess reserves from someone else, and you suddenly have more money on your balance sheet. You've increased the size of your balance sheet. That can meet uh, an outflow of deposits, for instance. Borrow from the Fed. If you really get into trouble, then borrow from the Fed through the discount window. It's usually a very low interest rate. So those are the two immediate sources of liquidity that you can find from the Federal Reserve. Three, increased deposits. So oftentimes when a bank has a problem um, with maybe some of its loans, um, it may increase deposits by having some deal or some some, uh, special offer if you open an account with that particular bank. seen all sorts of things. I mean, at one point there was a, a, a bank in the Midwest, I don't remember its name, that offered a free rifle shotgun. Uh, basically, if you, uh, <laughs> rifle style shotgun, if you if you open an account, uh, that type of thing. Sell liquid assets. So sell those T-bills that you might have as assets. And that all obviously gives you uh, increased uh, cash. And that means you can withstand Uh, withdrawal of deposits. Issue commercial paper. So that's on the the liquidity, on the, sorry, liability side of the balance sheet. If you just start issuing some IOUs, some short-term IOUs and hope someone's going to buy them. Obviously, that's another solution there. This is a, a question that bankers often ask, you know, how much liquidity is sufficient? Um, so the liquidity coverage ratio compares the level of easy to sell liquid assets to the total cash outflows that are expected over the next 30 calendar days. And uh, bankers look at this liquidity coverage ratio because that tends to tell them how ready they might be for a sudden outflow of deposits. In other words, do they have the, the, the wherewithal to make sure that they can fund those uh, 
and they don't send anyone away from the bank who wants to get their deposits out uh, empty-handed, which would then maybe cause a panic. There's also um, uh, regulations that are part of international and international banking accords, and they're called the Basel III. By the way, that implies, and this is the case, that there was a Basel I and a Basel II uh, before it. Yes, there was. Basel is a city in Switzerland, and uh, it is, in fact, the capital of Switzerland, I believe. Yes, it is. And um, basically, uh, Basel is the center of the um, uh, private client banking, really, in the world, I would say. Swiss banks are famous for their privacy. Uh, and so if you're really rich, by the way, you're likely to have a Swiss bank account. Um, you only have to remember that movie, what was it called, Ocean's 12, I think, where they all ended up in Switzerland, um, <laughs> doing a deal with a Swiss bank. Um, in any case, um, Basel III, yeah, Basel, you know, is where also the, um, uh, the central bank to the central bankers is located, um, and I forget its name right now, but uh, um, anyway, the uh, uh, it's a place where... Um, in Switzerland, where uh, many of the agreements have been negotiated um, at their headquarters um, for uh, or on um, uh, banking conditions, international banking conditions uh, that all banks should operate under. So Basel III says that um, banks should maintain a certain level of stable funding it depends on the liquidity of their assets and the extent of off-balance sheet exposures over the next 12 months. The goal is a ratio equal to or greater than one, the ratio there being the liquidity coverage ratio. So in order to satisfy Basel III, banks should also have that liquidity coverage ratio greater than one. There are other risks that banks face. One is an operational risk. Operational risk is the idea that the, the bank's operations may be at risk uh, due to incompetence or due to someone trying to hide something. Um, so that can be a problem. Um, secondly, foreign exchange and country risks, particularly big banks. Um, they have assets that are in foreign currencies. And when the foreign exchange rate moves, which it can do, and uh, it can move rapidly and by a long way, that can alter the value of the bank's assets significantly and very quickly. And country risk, uh, country risk refers to the idea that if you have investments in a certain country and that country becomes politically unstable for whatever reason, then that can also pose a risk to the bank. Um, it could be, for instance, you know, a good example of that would be Venezuela, for example, where um, uh, the government there decided to nationalize um, whole swathes of the economy, in which case, you know, loans that may be made to companies operating them there uh, in Venezuela and, the, uh, you know, what would happen if... if uh, um, if the government suddenly nationalized that company, uh, well, the government could then say, well, we're not paying any of the loans, you know, this is now a government company and we're starting fresh. In which case, you know, there'd be a risk there to the bank that had loaned that Venezuelan company the money. Market risk is the third one. Uh, market risk in the sense that, um, you know, interest rates can move quickly. And also, of course, um, you can get um, certain markets uh, where, um, for instance, you know, uh, mortgage, um, uh, mortgage secure, <coughs> excuse me, mortgage securities, mortgage-backed securities, which of course banks can hold, and this is what caused the previous recession to this one, and uh, the Great Recession, as it's called, and you know that was because many banks held those mortgage-backed securities on their, as assets on their balance sheet, and many of them went sour. 
And that caused a lot of bankruptcies of banks. Okay, um, banks have to have a balance sheet and like all companies, banks also have an income statement. And the bank's income statement looks at their revenues and expenses over a specific period of time. For a large bank, it'll be over a quarter. Um, they have to produce that for the SEC anyway if, they're trade, if their stock is trading on the stock market. Um, there are obviously different parts of the income statement. So one is gross interest income, gross interest expense, uh, and then the net interest income, which is the gross interest income minus the gross interest expense. Um, and then there's non-interest income, of course. Those could be fees, uh, off-balance sheet income as well. And non-interest expense, so uh, expenses not relating to, to the holding of deposits, etc. Um, or lending money out um, will be non-interest expense. So the expense of running the buildings, etc. When we evaluate the balance sheet of the banks, we look at the return on assets. That's net income divided by total assets. Um, a higher return on assets indicates that the... Uh, bank is generating more income from the assets that it has. Often that happens, of course, when interest rates are rising. Return on equity is the net income divided by the, uh, the equity capital, the value of that equity, in other words, value of the shares in the company, uh, in the bank. And the higher return on equity suggests that the bank is generating more net income as well uh, from, from its operations. So, um, uh, that's one way of looking or analyzing a balance sheet, or two ways, I should say. And that's the end of uh, this uh, part of the uh, video. I'm, I'm going to do another video which actually runs through this material in a little different way. Um, or So uh, anyway, thanks for listening.